Now remember, by the end of the 19th century, things are changing. Uh, factors are sort of coming into play to create an environment where if Theodore Roosevelt had not existed, someone would have had to invent him. Um, the United States is becoming a world power, however reluctantly. And what does that mean? Well, war and indeed foreign diplomacy has always concentrated authority in the presidential office. You can like that, you can dislike it, but it's a fact of, a fact of life. And then, too, you had William Randolph Hearst and other press lords. Um, because of them, newspaper readership had quadrupled in recent years. In fact, um, Hearst and Pulitzer, between them, it's staging, I mean, they staged the war. Cuba was a sideshow to the press war that was going on between Hearst and Pulitzer. But they used Cuba to jack up their circulation. And in fact, there were weeks during the, the, the Cuban-American War, Spanish-American War, when they were selling five million copies. Now, these are new, two New York newspapers. Um, that's extraordinary. And that suggests a whole new, vast audience that is being accustomed not only to reading about the news, but to reading a certain kind of news, and a certain approach to the news, a certain flamboyance, um, color, uh, drama, melodrama. Well, anyway, the fact is that all of this created opportunities for any leader who was willing and able to dramatize himself and his ideas. And that fit, that description fits Theodore Roosevelt to a T. So, enter TR. Um, he's William McKinley's vice president in 1900. McKinley is assassinated uh, in September of 1901. TR rushes to his bedside. The president seems to be recovering. Uh, Roosevelt um, leaves because he's very conscious of the press. He, first of all, he doesn't want people to think he's hovering like a vulture around a deathbed. But equally important, when it becomes apparent that the president's going to survive, he wants to boost public confidence in that fact, uh, and to minimize the threat to the nation. So he leaves, he goes, what does he do? He goes mountain climbing in the Adirondacks, and uh, he is uh, uh, on Mount Marcy, the tallest mountain in New York, late one night when he sees a small band approaching, and he knows in his heart it's not good news, and in fact it's not good news. Um, the president has taken a turn for the worse. T.R. gets in a stagecoach board and rides down the mountain in the middle of the night, a wonderful, appropriate beginning to his presidency. Uh, he gets to a train that's been held especially for him, learns that the president is dead, uh, rushes off to Buffalo, and does a more or less convincing imitation of sorrow. Um, that um, he pledges himself to uh, carry on the McKinley program uh, without, and, and, he, and he says to someone in his family, he says, you know, it is a terrible thing to come into the presidency this way. But it would be worse to be morose and, um, and paralyzed as a result. Um, he was, if not the most effective of presidents, he was certainly the most colorful and the most outspoken. Cartoonists loved him. He was a gift from the gods the caricature. They depicted him as old Dutch cleanser, scouring the grimy corridors of American politics. A magazine of the era captured Roosevelt's egotism as well as his irresistible news value when it celebrated, quote, this is the headline, the scrapes he gets into, the scrapes he gets out of, the things he attempts, the things he accomplishes, his appointments and his disappointments, the rebukes that he administers and those he receives, his assumptions, presumptions, omniscience, and deficiencies make up a daily tale which those of us who survive his tenure of the president's office will doubtless miss, as we might miss some property of the atmosphere we breathe. He was a force of nature. In his own words, I'm a Hamiltonian in my governmental views, especially with reference to the need of the exercise of broad powers by the national government. And that brings us back to his theory of stewardship. Basically, he believed he was the only elected official who represented all the people, unlike Congress, that was parochial, provincial, whatever. And remember, at this point, these senators weren't even elected by popular vote. They were chosen by state legislatures, and we all know how corrupt they were. 
purchased by the Rockefellers and, and others. So TR sees himself, first of all, as a steward of the national interest, a true Hamiltonian who believes in the imaginative use of power. But he goes a step further. He believes that, that he can do anything that is not expressly forbidden by the Constitution. Um, he was in many ways in office, if you, if you want to use modern labels, which are always dangerous, he was a combination of liberal and conservative. What he was undoubtedly was assertive. Uh, he used existing legislation, the Sherman Act of 1890, as an antitrust weapon against the meatpacking industry, the railroads, the big oil companies. Uh, Pure Food and Drug Act was uh, a uh, part of the TR uh, legacy, establishing the authority of the federal government to protect consumers. He strengthened the power of the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate railroad charges. He intervened in a coal strike in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, today this is, you know, taken for granted. But I guarantee you, before TR, when presidents intervened in labor situations, it was to call out federal troops to put down the strikers. TR did something quite different. He summoned both sides to Washington and locked them in a room and basically said, you know, don't come out until you uh, have a solution. Um, during the 1902 coal strike, his good friend Henry Cabot Lodge despaired of the political consequences of inaction. Isn't this something we can appear to be doing, he said to the president? TR had already worked himself into a lather over mounting coal shortages. Summoning a friendly senator to the White House, he gave vent to his frustration. I am the President of the United States. I am the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. I will see that the people have coal. But Mr. President, said the lawmaker, what do you expect to do with the Constitution of the United States, which provides for property rights and regards them as sacred? Roosevelt's face grew red and his voice rose to falsetto pitch. To hell with the Constitution when the people want coal! <laughs> his guest then hurried to the, to the home of Uncle Joe Cannon, the most powerful Republican in the House of Representatives. The President couldn't possibly have said such a thing, Cannon told his informant. Go ask him about it yourself if you don't believe me, said the Senator. An hour later, Uncle Joe returned with a look of amazement on his face. That fellow in the White House did say that. I went over and talked to him about it myself, and he said exactly that same to me, thing to me, and by God, I'm afraid of him. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people were afraid of, uh, of TR. Um, conservation is something that will forever be associated with Theodore Roosevelt. He was um, a visionary who understood that the frontier had been reached and that future frontiers really were frontiers of the mind. And, um, and he also believed as a steward that we have a responsibility to future generations. We are stewards of the land and the water and the air. And I guarantee you that was the first time that an American president took that viewpoint. This is what he said. We have become great because of the lavish use of our resources, and we have just reason to be proud of our growth. But the time has come to inquire seriously what will happen when our forests are gone, when the coal, the iron, the oil, and the gas are exhausted, when the soils have still further impoverished and washed into the streams, polluting the rivers, denuding the fields, obstructing navigation. These questions do not relate only to the next century or to the next generation. It is time for us now, as a nation, to exercise the same reasonable foresight in dealing with our great natural resources that would be shown by any prudent man in conserving and widely using the property which contains the assurance of well-being for himself and his children. <laughs>